We're really glad you're here for our virtual 2020 event. And before the event uh, gets underway, I, I need to go through some housekeeping details. If you would like to ask any questions or share any comments, please just type them in the chat section. And you can do that by clicking on the conversation bubble at the bottom of your screen or in comment section on Facebook. And I'll pass along as many as possible at the end of the session. We also allow you to turn on your audio and video at the end of the session so you can ask your questions directly. In addition to attending festival presentations like this one, we really encourage you to visit our virtual exhibitors hall on the SDHC Facebook page, where you can learn more about authors, publishers, and cultural organizations, and you can win some prizes too in the process. You can also buy any of these books by our presenting authors at Zambros Variety Special Online Festival Bookstore, which is at Zambros dot com z a n d b r o z dot com or for children's authors at child's play toys child's play toys sf dot com you'll find buttons at sdbookfestival.com that will take you directly to those booksellers to help us continue to improve the festival we'd appreciate you filling out an evaluation form we'll email you the link up to this form after the festival is all, all done and you can also find that in the chat section on Zoom. Finally, you can help keep the festival free by making a tax-deductible donation to the South Dakota Humanities Council. Just visit our website, sdhumanities.org, and click the Donate button. It's super easy. I did it yesterday, and I will not miss the $10 each month. I know that. This festival would not be possible without the generous support of the numerous organizations and individuals who have already donated and are acknowledged on the back cover of the festival guide and on our website. So you can download that at the website as well if you haven't already. And now on with the show. This program is called All Guns Fired at One Time, Hearing the Native Voices of Wounded Knee. And Jerome Green is here with us today. Uh, I have a little bit of a background on him that I'd like to read. Jerome A. Green is a retired historian, curator, and manager with the National Park Service and author of 23 books. A U.S. Army veteran, he taught at Haskell Indian Nations University and served on the editorial boards of several historical journals. His book, American Carnage, Wounded Knee, 1890, received the Spur Award for the Best Western Historical Nonfiction from the Western Writers of America. Green's newest books are January Moon, the Northern Cheyenne Breakout from Fort Robinson, 1878 to 1879, and our featured book today, All Guns Fired at Once, Native Voices of Wounded Knee. Welcome, Jerome. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you folks again. Um, I want to show you the new book, Hot Off the Press, all Guns Fired at One Time, Native Voices of Wounded Knee, 1890. And I want to thank especially the members of the South Dakota Historical Society Press. This is a beautiful, beautiful book. And I was just blown away when I received a copy just two days ago. So uh, I think it's going to be a, 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 a real uh, a jewel for the press, and I'm looking forward to uh, speaking to you about the book. I'd like to mention, too, that the book is dedicated to Michael Hermeny Horses, uh, who is a dear friend, and uh, he passed away last year. Without him, I could not have produced the uh, Wounded Knee book that was just referenced, or this book. He contributed much to this book and to the earlier book. And uh, he contributed a number of accounts. This book, All, Fun All Guns Fired at One Time, Native Voices of Wounded Knee, talks about the Wounded Knee Massacre, uh, which occurred on 29 December 1890 and involved the loss of more than 200 Lakota men, women, and children in South Dakota. And it marked the cl tragic climax of the Indian Wars in the American West. 
It followed myriad conflicts throughout the region before, during, and following the Civil War, but by its horrifically disproportionate loss of lives and property, embodied one of the worst human tragedies involving American Indians throughout four centuries of contact with European Americans. Most directly, what happened at Wounded Knee highlighted the miscarriage of the United States government's Indian policy, which sought to introduce the tenets of white civilization among the Lakota people, and notably here, the Minikanju constituency, and to confine them on the reservations. Wounded Knee thus broadly stemmed from federal enterprise in the West. One of its worst antecedents occurred at Sand Creek, Colorado Territory, where a massacre of Southern Cheyennes by federalized troops in 1864 provoked years of intermittent fighting between soldiers and American Indians, including Lakotas, throughout the Great Plains. In 1867 and 1868, tribal representatives signed treaties with the federal government establishing reservations. But in the wake of gold discoveries and White's quest for land in the Black Hills, more warfare ensued. Following the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, where in the Sioux and their allies defeated Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer's 7th Cavalry Command, government troops intently subdued the Lakotas consigning them to the Great Sioux Reservation in today's Western South Dakota. Appointed agents then sought to acculturate the Lakotas through labor, schooling, and other precepts of white society. Over time, the quest among settlers, cattlemen, and politicians to open American Indian land for settlement by whites manifested itself politically in the dismantling of the Great Sioux Reservation into several smaller reserves. The Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, a parcel of the former Great Sioux Reservation fashioned by obligatory agreement with the Indians in 1889, became a significant component of the Wounded Knee story. The Pine Ridge Track comprise spacious acreage in southwestern Dakota Territory adjoining the northern boundary of Nebraska. The Cheyenne River Indian Reservation, a similar expanse carved from the prior reserve, was located on the north side of that stream 50 miles north of the Pine Ridge boundary. The Standing Rock, Rosebud, Crow Creek, and Lower Brule reservations were also established at the time. The reapportionments increased malaise and fostered further suspicion and unrest among the Lakota people. Hey, Jerry? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Would you care if you turn, could you turn on your video? Would that be okay? We did not get to see the book. Um, is that possible for you to just so turn that on? Oh, oh, that's so great. Thank you. Thank you. I, Continue on. All right. We'd love to see the book too. It's the book. Oh, that's wonderful. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, that's, that's fine. The reapportionments increased malaise and fostered further suspicion and unrest among the Lakota people. By late 1889, worsening drought compounded by reductions in government treaty rations devastated families and bred uncertainty over their basic survival. Chronic misery intensified by hunger and crippling disease ultimately fostered desperation among the Lakota people and influenced many, including the Minikanjus, to embrace transcendent help. Amid mounting social distress, many of the Sioux welcomed tenets of the ghost dance, an inspirational ritual that had influenced other tribes. Through the ghost dance, American Indian people saw divine deliverance from white oppression, the opportunity to return to old ways, and notably 
spiritual reunion with dead relatives. Ghost dances variously took place on the Pine Ridge, Rosebud, and Cheyenne River reservations. Anticipating trouble, the United States War Department sent troops onto the Lakota lands in response. It became an explosive mix. <clears throat> On the Standing Rock Indian Reservation, pervasive dancing in mid-December instigated the Indian police's killing of the principal Hunkpapa Lakota leader, Sitting Bull. Word of the deed spread quickly, and when the news reached Cheyenne River, Chief Bigfoot welcomed three dozen frightened Hunkpapa refugees fleeing Standing Rock, fearful of attack by soldiers patrolling the Cheyenne River. Bigfoot hurriedly resolved to avoid trouble by leading his Minneconjus and the newly arrived Hunkpapas south to Pine Ridge Agency, where he had been summoned to counsel with Oglala Chief Red Cloud in hopes of stemming conflict with the soldiers. On the night of 23 December, the apprehensive Bigfoot, now sick with pneumonia, headed south with some 300 people many of them riding in wagons with others walking alongside monitoring cattle and ponies. At Pine Ridge, Army forces under Brigadier General John R. Brook occupied camps around the agency. On 26 December, General Brook ordered Colonel James W. Forsyth, who had been alerted of Bigfoot's movement, to direct four troops of the 7th Cavalry under Major Samuel M. Woodside into the field. Oglala scouts and the men of Light Battery E, 4th Artillery with two Hotchkiss guns accompanied the troops. The next day, the command marched 18 miles northeast of the agency and set up camp near Wounded Knee Creek. On 28 December, Whitside soldiers rode nine miles northeast, hoping to intercept Bigfoot and his people. Scouts soon spotted the Minneconjus east of Porcupine Butte. <clears throat> and after negotiating with the chief, by then prostrated with illness, the people submitted. <clears throat> Excuse me. The troops escorted them to the cavalry camp adjoining the west side of Wounded Knee Creek. The Minneconjus set up their meager teepees, wiki ups, and wagons with their ponies and dogs immediately north of a wide, deep ravine extending from high ground on the west down to Wounded Knee Creek, 700 feet east of the Indian camp. The 7th Cavalry bivouacked atop a broad ridge, ridge on the north. That evening, the troops issued bacon, hardtack, coffee, and sugar to the people as their ponies grazed nearby. The ailing Bigfoot was placed in an army tent on level ground below the cavalry camp where doctors attended him. Unknown to Bigfoot's people, the Army planned to conduct them to nearby Nebraska, where trains would remove them from the region. Whitside and a dispatch to Forsyth at Pine Ridge Agency announced the capture of Bigfoot and called for the remaining four 7th Cavalry troops to bolster his men during the planned disarmament of the Minneconjus in the morning. Whitside also asked, for the remaining two Hotchkiss guns and the accompanying soldiers of Battery E, 4th Artillery. Forsyth and his contingent arrived at 8.30 p.m. and the artillery soldiers labored into the wee hours readying their armament on a low rise about 300 feet south and directly overlooking the north side of the Sioux camp. On the night of 28 December, the troops and Indians occupied a gently undulating landscape extending from a moderate rise 500 yards west of Wounded Knee Creek, upon which the artillerymen 
toil through the night in placing their guns. I should point out that Hotchkiss guns were a form of early uh, a kind of machine gun, and they fired a two pound of fixed shells that exploded on impact. They also fired canister cartridges containing each containing 30 one half inch lead balls. So th those were kind of er uh, anti personnel uh, weapons. Uh, both uh, of these uh, forms of ammunition would be used at wounded knee. Immediately east and northeast of the battery stood troop bivouac areas, while tents for Old Lala scouts and an adjoining picket line for army mules stood to the south. Bigfoot's tent was near the scout tents, beyond them a line of army supply wagons. From there, the open terrain that would play so critical a role in the coming events gradually declined 600 yards to the deep ravine, the deep ravine that trailed down to Wounded Knee Creek. On its north lip stood teepees, assorted wickiup shelters and wagons comprising the Lakota camp, which took the form of a straggling crescent, its eastern end closer to the ravine than its north trending western end. The total broad area covered approximately one quarter section, 160 acres or so embracing the high ground on the north and the big ravine, the big ravine on the south. At the center of the camp, the people raised a white flag on a stick denoting their peaceful intent while their ponies and cattle grazed to the west across a path called Fast Horse Road. Troops closely guarded this road, which paralleled the north edge of the camp all through the night. On the morning of 29 December, Forsyth and his officers designated a council area, a level space fronting near Bigfoot's tent and situated well below the artillery contingent and troop bivouacs on the north, and the Lakota camp on the south, all together encompassing roughly an acre. It was here that the first shooting erupted. Soon after dawn, a clear, calm day, and following a breakfast of army rations distributed among the Lakotas, native criers circulated calling on the men to assemble at the council area to hear Colonel Forsyth speak. The men, many wearing blankets and sheets, congregated as directed in groups and took seats on the grass. Despite the morning chill, no snow appeared on the ground. Bigfoot, extremely sick, declined to participate and remained in his tent. With Whitside, other officers, and interpreter Philip F. Wells at hand, Forsyth greeted the people. He spoke of the circumstances of the moment and announced that they would soon be departing for Pine Ridge Agency. He further called for the surrender of the band's weapons, explaining that they would be compensated for them. When no guns appeared to be forthcoming, he told them to return to their camp in groups, collect their guns, and bring them to the council area. He made no mention of the plan to remove the Lakotas east by train. After an extended period, the men returned to the council with but few guns, all outmoded and in derelict condition, which the sergeants and privates collected in piles west of the assembly. None of the firearms that the Minikanjus had visibly brandished the preceding day seemed to be included. Brooks men counted 120 warriors in the assembly, a figure that did not correlate with the relatively few guns relinquished. Soldiers now brought Bigfoot forward from his tent and requested that he direct his followers to listen to foresight. 
The colonel then ordered two companies, B and K of the 7th Cavalry, to march along either side of the seated Lakotas, then flank them on the south and west to keep the assembly in check. Two squads of soldiers from those companies then entered the camp to search for weapons. In discordant fashion, the troops disrupted the women and children, tossing their possessions about and leaving lodges and wickiups in disarray, thus further provoking the Lakotas. The soldiers seized perhaps four dozen guns, as well as bows, arrows, axes, knives, crowbars, and scissors, anything that might be construed as a weapon. The guns yielded were mostly damaged, derelict, and useless. Returning to the council, the troops tossed the retrieved weapons onto the piles. The Lakota men in the assembly, meantime, heard the repeated cries and wailing of upset women and children emanating from the camp, constituting yet another irritant. Distrusting the Lakotas in the council area, Forsyth directed his soldiers to individually search the warriors, checking their blankets for not only guns, but ammunition belts. At approximately 9.15 a.m., he instructed the Lakota men to return to their camp by passing between soldier details arranged at the southwest corner of the assembly where each would be searched for guns and ammunition. Around the same time, a medicine man in the council area began agitating and haranguing against the troops and the searches. He had earlier initiated ghost dance movements, repeatedly gathering up dirt in his hands and tossing it toward the soldiers. When the searches began, however, he argued loudly as he moved among the younger men seated in the rear of the assembly, now exhorting them to resist the troops. Forsyth at last induced the man to sit down while Father Francis Kraft, a Catholic prelate who had accompanied the soldiers from Pine Ridge, moved about with crucifix in hand, trying to calm the people amid their surging anxiety. As the searches commenced, some of the warriors vacillated while the older men ascended and began filing south through the opening between the troops, giving up their arms and ammunition. As they did, the medicine man suddenly back on his feet, recommenced his haranguing and excitedly exhorted the younger men to resist. He at last raised his hands to the sun, declaring the soldiers' bullets would not harm them. Just as two soldiers struggled to yank a rifle from a young man, the medicine man bent down to scoop up and toss dirt skyward. A shot precipitously rang out, and as a sudden furor erupted, an officer was heard to scream above the rising din, look out, they've broken. The shooting and killing that ensued to include the imminent barrage of fire from the Hotchkiss guns north of the Indian camp would result in at least 146, and likely more than 200, Lakota dead, with many others wounded, while Army losses totaled 46 men killed and 36 wounded. These are the essential prefatory details about Wounded Knee. What happened next is presented in this book by Lakota survivors and collateral witnesses who best tell the story from this point forward. In the reminiscence statements and commentaries, readers will discern occasional repetition in the accountings of the events of 29 December 1890. Yet such recurrence tends to accentuate and ratify the profound terror and distress the Lakota people and their families endured on that altogether horrific and tragic day. In most cases, the accounts by different individuals reflect not only commonly shared perceptions of what happened at Wounded Knee, but also the unique individual perspectives of contributors. Occasionally, participants rendered more than one account of their remembrance of events. 
Iron Hail, also known as Dewey Beer, throughout the course of his long life following Wounded Knee, provided at least five or six descriptions of the, of the event, possibly even more. Such multiple statements are presented herein chronologically. Most of the early accounts, that is those given during the weeks and months directly following Wounded Knee, as well as in the immediately subsequent years, describe the sheer horror there as the people individually witness family members and friends being injured, maimed, and killed, often in front of them, as they themselves struggled to survive. These elements also characterize statements that emerged in the decade or so following the massacre. During the early period of the 20th century, however, amid discussion regarding government compensation for survivors, especially as congressional efforts advanced in the early 1930s, a rash of participant accounts from expectant and aging Lakota survivors of wounded knee emerged. With hopes thus raised, more of the people grew inclined to speak openly of, or in some cases to re-express their remembrances. Although the anticipated compensation never materialized, many accounts generated during that period of expectancy reflected the Lakota's urgent commitment not to forget what happened to them on that terrible day. For them and succeeding generations, wounded knee thus serves as an exclamation point to the societal trauma they endured from the 1850s forward. Beyond symbolic, for them, Wounded Knee was forever cataclysmic in a fundamentally personal yet existential way. Beyond the reflections of Lakota participants, this volume presents the accounts of government employed American Indian scouts and interpreters, as well as full and mixed blood Lakota observers who either partook directly in the events or witnessed and recorded the carnage in its aftermath. Included too are accounts from medical personnel chronicling the treatment of injured Lakotas in the days following the massacre, as well as a correspondence description of the dedication of the Lakota erected monument overlooking the field 13 years later. Further, the volume includes contemporary rosters of tribal members who took part in the action. The selections embody a variety of little known sources explaining what happened at Wounded Knee, encompassing early and later accounts by men, women, and grown children that appeared in official government reports, newspapers, and collected published reminiscences, including a few diary and published commentaries of non-Indian observers that bear directly on this subject. It must be stated that most of the adult men of warrior age who had attended the morning council at Wounded Knee died there. Other selections have been drawn from transcripts contributed by survivor participants to include American Indian government employees that repose today in various public institutions. Comprehensive source information is provided for each of the entries. Editorial comments appear in brackets and certain punctuation elements have been standardized for clarity and readability. I've chosen one of the accounts to present to you this morning. Physician and ethnologist James R. Walker transcribed this account by Dewey Beer during Walker's tenure at the Pine Ridge Reservation from 1896 to 1914. As a young man, Beard was known as Iron, Iron Hail and had fought at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. Beard, who was born circa 1856 and died in 1955, was perhaps 34 years old at the time of Wounded Knee. 
His long and fascinating life is well chronicled in Philip Burnham, Song of Dewey Beard, last survivor of the Little Bighorn, published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2014. Walker's transcription is accepted here from James R. Walker, Lakota Society, edited by Raymond J. DeMalley. Some elements of Beard's rendering in this statement appear out of sequence when compared to his other accounts also presented herein. Nonetheless, they are printed as he apparently explained them to Dr. Walker. On the morning of, De of December 29th, the bugles sounded and the soldiers surrounded the Indian camp. Some soldiers were on foot and they were nearest the Indians and some were on horses and they were further away out around the others. A half-breed named Philip Wells interpreted for the officer and said, all the Indians get in a ring and there will be a council. Then all the Indians sat in a ring except four men and the women and children and Bigfoot who was still in his tent under guard. Then the soldiers came up close around the Indians on three sides and the soldiers on the horses were farther away across a deep ditch, meaning the big ravine. Some of the soldiers were about the cannon on the hill, meaning the Hotchkiss guns, and some were in a line by the camp of the soldiers. Then the interpreter said that the officer wanted the Indians to give up all their arms. An Indian asked what Bigfoot said about this, and the interpreter said that Bigfoot said for the Indians to give up their guns to the officer. Then the Indians all went into their teepees. I dug a hole in the ground and buried my gun inside the teepee. And when I came out, a great many guns were piled nearby where the Indians were sitting. When I sat down, there were soldiers behind me and soldiers on both sides of me. I was looking towards the hill at the cannon, so I did not feel afraid. Then the officer said, you have 25 more guns and I want you to bring them out. I know that you have more guns for we counted them yesterday. You have plenty of cartridges and knives and I want you to give them all up. But the Indians had piled nearly all their guns in the pile and not more than four or five had hidden their guns. My father asked the officer if the great father, the president, would feed the Indians after he took all the guns away from them. The officer said, I don't know anything about that. All I know is that I am going to get all the guns and they are not all in that pile. But the Indians would not bring any more guns. Then one of four Indians who would not come into the circle at first came and sat down with the rest. The other three were the medicine man and the two young men named Black Fox and Yellow Turtle. Black Fox and Yellow Turtle said they would not give up their guns and they held them in their hands. They told the officer they would give up all their cartridges and could carry their guns empty. But the officer said they must give up their guns. The officer was talking very excitedly to the soldiers and the medicine man began to sing a prayer to the great spirit. Then an under officer and two soldiers started towards Black Fox and Yellow Turtle. Yellow Turtle said to the soldiers, my friends do not come to me in that way for I do not want to hurt you. Then he said to Black Fox, now you will see if I am brave. Do not give up your gun. Black Fox said to the soldiers, keep away from me. I will die before I will let you have my gun. And if I die, I will take some of you with me. Then some of the Indians said, they are going to shoot us. Let us get our guns and get to that ditch, the big ravine, 
and get away. My father said to the medicine man, now is the time for help. Now do your best. Then the medicine man stopped his singing and began to cry to the great spirit and gathered up a handful of dirt and threw it towards the sky and waved his blanket under the dust as they did in the ghost dance when they called for the Messiah. Just then the officer came out of a teepee with a gun in his hand and I was looking at it for I thought it was my gun. And I heard a soldier cry out, look out, look out. And someone cried out an Indian, stop, don't shoot. Immediately, both Black Fox and Yellow Turtle turned and raised their guns and fired. Then all the Indians jumped up. Some cried that we would all be killed and some cried, get your guns and get away. Several shots were fired by the soldiers on both sides of us and both Black Fox and Yellow Turtle fell. Yellow Turtle began to sing his death song and raised on, on his elbow, shot at the soldiers. It appeared to me that all the soldiers began to shoot and I saw Indians falling all around me. I was not expecting anything like this. An Indian shouted in my ear, get your gun. I was very much frightened and started to run. I saw some soldiers running and I ran that way. I ran into smoke so thick that I could not see anything. While I was running, I took my knife out. The first thing I saw in the smoke was the brass buttons on a soldier's coat. A gun was thrust towards me and fired and it was so close that it burned my hair. I grabbed the gun and stabbed at the soldier with my knife. I stabbed him three times and he let go of the gun. I tripped and fell and when I got up, I found that I was among the soldiers aiming at me and I felt something hit me in the shoulder and I fell down. Before I got to the ditch, I saw some soldiers coming towards me and I charged towards them for I thought I was dead anyway. They ran back into the smoke. I went on towards the ditch and came to a dead soldier and I stopped and cut off his belt of cartridges. For the cartridges I had would not fit the gun I had taken from the soldier. I tried to take his gun also, but I was too weak to carry it. I got into the ditch and an Indian gave me a carbine he had taken from a dead soldier. Then the fast firing cannon, the Hotchkiss, began to fire and I began to crawl up the ditch. I met Whiteface, my wife, coming down the ditch. She was shot, the ball passing through her chin and shoulder. She said to me, let me go, you go on, we will die soon. I will get my mother, that is her body at the top of the bank. She went up to her mother's body and took it under the arms to lift it up. When she fell dead, shot again. I came up on the bank for I thought I would as well die quickly. Just as I got to the top of the bank, an Indian pulled me back and as I fell back, he was shot through the head. I took his cartridges as they suited the carbine I had and I started up the ditch again. I saw a woman coming towards me with a revolver in her hand. It looked like a soldier's revolver and I think she took it from a soldier for she was very bloody. I crawled up the ditch as fast as I could and I came to White Lance, my brother. He was sitting against the bank and another brother pursued was lying by him. They were both wounded and pursued was almost dead. He said, my brothers, we will all be dead soon, but you must kill as many as you can before you die. They had three belts of cartridges taken from soldiers. When we saw that pursue, pursued was dead, we went behind a little knoll where the ditch turns and where we could see the soldiers and we fired at them. I looked and saw the Hotchkiss aiming at us. White Lance and I lay down close behind the knoll and the dirt and gravel scattered over us. 
thrown up by the Hotchkiss cannon. I got very sick and weak and thirsty and could shoot no more. I could hear the soldiers coming close by me and I saw a soldier peep over the bank. I fired at him, but I was too weak to take aim. The soldiers ran back and they fired the Hotchkiss again and a shot from it cut Hawkfeather almost in two. Some, shows, some, some, show, some soldiers were on a hill not far from the cannon and they shot at me also. One of their bullets struck so near me that it threw the gravel in my face and I thought I was shot again. I lay very still and in a little while all quit shooting at me. After a long time, all the firing stopped. I crawled over the top of the hill and my brother Joseph Horncloud yelled at them and Jack LaPlante came to me with a horse, but I could not ride. So they put their arms around me and took me away. But I was so sick, I told my brother to go and leave me. But he said, we have started for the agency and we will go there together or we will die together. Then some of the Oglala Sioux came to us from Pine Ridge and they told us that all the Indians had gone from the agency to the hostiles camp with Short Bull located farther north of the agency. So I went to Short Bull's camp, but when I got there, I found that the Indians were not all there. But I was so badly wounded, I could be taken no farther then. I learned while there that my father, whose name was Horncloud, my mother, whose name was Yellow Leaf, my wife, whose name was Pursued, and my sister, whose name was Her Horses, had all been killed in the fight. And that my two brothers, White Lance and Enemy, were wounded. I'm gonna stop there. There are 78 separate accounts in the book, as well as the lists of Lakota fatalities mentioned earlier. There is also a map of the Wounded Knee Field, which readers might use to correlate the various perspectives provided by the accounts. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any uh, question, I'll try any questions that is. Do I have to click on something? Well, hi, Jerry. Yes, no, wonderful. Thank you for that, Jerry. That was really beautiful. And yeah, all those accounts are just simply amazing. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody here uh, if they have any questions, if they could please type them in the chat. And all you ha have to do is click on that little bubble, you know, the, the kind of cartoon bubble on the bottom, and that opens up the chat for you. And now we do have one question from Cal. How did you collect the accounts? Well, the accounts, I, I started collecting when I was uh, uh, writing my book on uh, Wounded Knee that appeared uh, a few years back. And uh, I uh, was very, uh, obviously, I got a lot of uh, army accounts and official accounts, but I got uh, um, Indian accounts, uh, native accounts that were published in newspapers in the uh, weeks and months after a wounded knee and some uh, many years later, there's one by a man named Jim Methseth, uh, and that was published in the Indian Historian magazine in 1971. Uh, as I mentioned, Dewey Beard left a number of accounts, and I've, I've got uh, I've got five or six of them in this this book. They're all different accounts but they all describe the same thing. Um, so there's uh, not really any redundancy among the accounts, except for the fact that he was there and what he witnessed. Um, 
There were some accounts uh, published, previously published in books, and I was fortunate to secure permission from the various presses to use those accounts in this book. Uh, so I used uh, accounts that were uh, uh, given by uh, Native uh, people in later years uh, during the 1930s, as I mentioned, when there was a hope of compensation, a lot of the people uh, met with the uh, agent at Pine Ridge Reservation then and gave uh, accounts to him. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I realized that uh, he published those in a book uh, called The Wounded Knee Massacre of the Sioux in the 30s. And uh, we did a, a check on uh, copyright and found out that that copyright had expired a long time ago. So I was free to use those and, uh, and, uh, and incorporated those into the book. So you have perspectives of sometimes the same person from right after the incident all the way up into the early years of the 20th century. And you can compare those if you care to speak, if you care to do so, such as Dewey Beard. So uh, other people say, uh, it's just powerful reading. Um, they're stunned by the accounts, they're just speechless over this. Uh, Gregory Bryan asks, I'm wondering what you think of the site today. Do you think anything maybe should be done to preserve the site and to encourage visitors. Do you think visitors should be encouraged or discouraged? Well, I think visitors should be encouraged. And uh, it, it's uh, especially <laughs> with this book in hand. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, if you read the accounts and if you stand on that hill where the mass grave is, there are 146 people that were buried, just dumped into this mass grave and covered up uh, three days later. Uh, but if you're standing on that hill and with this book or, or, or other books in hand that contain these native accounts, you can readily look and see the landscape that uh, lies out before you. You can see the big ditch, it's still there. There's a highway that runs right down below it and kind of mars the, the historic landscape. It was put in by the BIA back in the 20s or 30s, I believe, but it's still there. It's a functioning uh, um, roadway. Um, that's what I would do, and I, and I actually did it. I mean, I took some of these accounts with me up on that hill and you get a wonderful perspective looking down. And, uh, and you often see, you often encounter uh, other Lakota people who are visiting the site up there. So it deeply resonates with them today. Were there any investigations of this event or disciplinary actions taken against any of the, the soldiers? Uh, no, not really. Um, a number of them actually received uh, medals of honor uh, for their participation there. And that is uh, through the years and even today as, is uh, quite uh, controversial. Um, uh, there were soldiers uh, killed, uh, I should say, I think there were 30, 30 killed and 36 wounded among the soldiers. Um, the total number of Indians, uh, Lakotas killed um, was 146, but a later estimate by the army raised that uh, by uh, 20 more people who apparently were not buried there. Some were buried, were hauled off, bodies were hauled off by tribesmen and buried elsewhere. 
And uh, I think the uh, federal uh, estimate is uh, at least 200 were killed at Wounded Knee today. That's the estimate today. And, and, that, and I would agree with that from the research that I've done too. So I was gonna ask if anybody here has also been there other than Jim, um, just, or Jerry, excuse me, and just um, to kind of speak on that a little bit in the chat, just what you, what you felt, what you saw. Um, I have not been there myself, but I have been other places like um, Bear Butte. And, and, you know, that is kind of an interesting thing that's occurring, as you suggest, Jerry, that there are many, you know, modern day Native people that are gathering at these places and they're celebrating their history. And they're also starting more and more to share it with those of us that really want to learn. So I just wanted to see if anybody else had, you know, had a similar experience. I found it really help, helpful for me just be there. So if anybody has, just type it on in the chat. I would mention that uh, um, in the George and Eleanor McGovern uh, collection, at the, at the uh, uh, university in, in South Dakota. Um, they have, uh, I found the account of a, a woman who uh, was, whose uh, throat was damaged from breathing the smoke. We can't imagine how thick the smoke was there because it was all firing all the guns including the Hotchkiss guns were firing uh, using black powder in the bullets and in their cartridges and it quickly filled the, the whole area as I say it was a calm day it wasn't windy so it just settled that everybody and people were inhaling that and uh, there's one lady named Nellie and I found a note from her and she was complaining of how bad the smoke was there and it, and it really uh, affected her for years, uh, bothered her. So a few things that we have in the chat are from Betty Sheldon. She says, I have not visited, but it's on my list. Visit Whitestone, North Dakota every so often. The spirits are strongly felt. Uh, from Gregory Bryan, I've been there a couple of times. I'm not sure I was altogether comfortable there, though, which is why I was curious to know what Jerome thought. Um, Marty Watson says, I have been there, powerful, have taken youth, and they wept. Cindy Wilson says, I have been there, but honestly, I felt like I was trespassing. I wanted to explore to feel it, yet I felt like I should not be there. It felt sacred, and I wasn't sure exactly where things took place. I would love to learn more and return. And Barbara said, even the wind cried when I visited this site. Very moving. Phyllis at Cold Eye says, yes, I've been there. Like others, I felt like I was on sacred ground and didn't know if it was appropriate. Deborah Gangloff says, I have been there many times. I agree with Cindy. It is a sacred site, not, not a tourist site or a place for Lukey Lou's. Plus, it is a cemetery that I believe is currently used. And Pamela Osna says, I've been there several times. It was a profoundly moving experience each time. Have taken my children. I feel it's a responsibility to show them this history. And finally, from Kathy B, there was a commemoration on the 100th anniversary. My son and I were there. It was a super cold day and Governor Mickelson was not wearing a hat. There had been a group who rode on horseback and some walking along Bigfoot's route. During the ceremony, the horses and their riders stood all around the fenced area, so still in the freezing cold, giving tribute. People came from various places in the world for this, so. Well, those are, are great comments and uh, very, uh, very appropriate. Um, I've been up there several times in uh, different seasons. Uh, usually when I'm up there, the wind is just blowing uh, horridly. I mean, it's, it's enough to 
make you run for your car. Um, this is up on the hill, but uh, it's very windy uh, most of the time, I'd say. Well, are there any other final questions? And many people are saying thank you. Just, you know, what it's just been a, a wonderful experience. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and Betty Sheldon mentions neither wolf nor dog movie features a most authentic scene from there. Great, great. Well, if you uh, go, if you plan to go, this is a, a good starting point, if, especially if you're interested in the uh, Indian perspective too. And my, my book is uh, uh, On Wounded Knee is uh, also out and uh, you can, uh, uh, it's called American Carnage. I almost choke when I say the title anymore, but that's the title, American Carnage. Wounded Knee, 1890. But this one all is, is a good accompaniment to that book. Read the first one if you want, and you'll get a, a good uh, explanation of the overall story as to what happened, why it happened. This deals primarily with the Native point of view. So one thing I've been doing recently too is I'm getting to know more Native people in South Dakota just you know through relationships and there through them I'm learning you know about their ancestry and then I'm able to you know they can bring me along you know as as a friend as someone to try to help understand so there's there's bridge builders that are modern day and they're descendants of many of these people that were there and of the chiefs and you know they're you know they're not that large of a group of people so they're all very intertwined so you know honestly I, they've been really it's been encouraging to get to know them and i'm sure everybody on this panel has you know some connection with some native people which is incredibly helpful to do that my friend uh, michael her many horses who passed away last year um, I was fortunate enough to meet him when I was beginning my earlier book, and uh, I couldn't have done it without him. He knew everybody on the reservation. He had been an, a council member and, uh, and held several uh, positions with the tribe. Um, a great guy, great sense of humor, and he knew, uh, he, he took me to places that I would not have wanted to go by myself. You could, a, yeah. I don't know if we get cut off at noon, but who is on the cover of your book? Deborah is asking. Who are those also, three? This is uh, Dewey Beard and his two brothers. Oh, okay. Who were at uh, Wounded Knee. And, uh, He's the last living person, or, right? Wasn't he the last survivor? Uh, no. No? Believe it or not, there was a lady who uh, died in 1971 who was an infant at Wounded Knee. And Jessie Running, Running Horse, I believe, was her name. Her name is mentioned in, the, uh, in my uh, American Carnage book. But uh, that just blew me away that somebody was breathing air on the, the same air that I was breathing. Uh, who was at Wounded Knee. Here's a few last closing thoughts. Thanks so much, Jerome. I have a few of your books and I enjoy them greatly. My new copy of January Moon and All Guns are due to arrive on Monday. Marty says, thank you. I look forward to reading your work. And Phyllis says, this reminds me of Through Dakota Eyes related to the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. Thank you, Jerome. And from Betty, um, the descendants are telling their family stories from generations of being taught orally. Amazing how much is carried within. It really is. To answer the question of who is with Dewey Beard, um, his brothers Daniel Horncloud and Joseph Horncloud are in the picture with Dewey Beard. And that's also reproduced inside the book. So if you damage the jacket, you still got the picture. Well, I think that's what we have time for today. And 
just thank you so much, Jerome, for being here and all, all the, the work that you do and the writings that you're preserving and all those voices that you're sharing with us. We truly appreciate it. Welcome you back, hopefully in person next time. Well, same here. Thanks to all of you and thanks for turning out for this. And come back next week when I'm talking about January Moon. Yeah, no, that's great. That would be wonderful. Uh, Friday, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, there's lots of great things in October, too. Well, have a great day, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.